So if you started a business, if you established your new enterprise, you started it, you're getting some success at it, and now you're facing some stagnation and growth. You have a hard time scaling and getting to the next level of your business. Well, this episode's for you. Many entrepreneurs find it very easy, very simple to start your own business. Very simple to go from an area where you, you were pissed off about your current job situation. Say, you know what? I can do it better than my boss. You start your own business. Or you get recruited into a new industry and new beginnings altogether. And the things that led you to the initial success of your business now is daunting to get to the next level of your business. Well, I'm going to cover with you five points here to get you to that next level. And these five points are clarity, market research, business planning, KPIs, and execution. So let's start with clarity. When you first started your business, something led you to start your business. Either you were upset about your current situation or there was an opportunity you wanted to, to take advantage of. Either way, however you got to starting your business, you're excited, you're primed, you're pumped, you're willing to do the day-to-day. -day. And like most entrepreneurs, when you're in the day-to-day -day and you keep your focus down into what you got to do on a day-to-day -day basis, said we have to lift our heads back up to see what we are clear on the path that we're heading on. Otherwise, we're heading ourselves hitting ourselves and leaning to ourselves into a brick wall. So in order to scale your business, you have to have clarity and what your business is all about to begin with and stay focused in on that mission, stay focused in on that purpose, and also find systems and processes that help you get to the next level without everything completely depending upon you. So a great resource book for this is the book, Your Next Five Moves by Patrick Bay David. I've been working with Patrick Bay David going on nine years now, starting in 2015. He was introduced to me by a mutual friend who was a pastor, Pastor Dudley Rutherford, who ran the Shepherd of the Hills Church, and I was introduced to Patrick by David by my sister, Jocelyn, who now runs a anti-human trafficking nonprofit campaign called nonprofit organization called Slavery No More. But nonetheless, we got introduced by a referral that led to certain con conversations, and Patrick recruited me in 2015, and I saw how clear he was about the vision he was accomplishing, and we qualified for a company paid trip in Dubai. Uh, six, seven months after our onboarding with PHP Agency as a incentive for my wife and I to get up and going in our first year with PHP Agency. And if you read that book in chapter one, he talks about clarity. Patrick actually mentions my wife and I in that book because at yeah, this trip in Dubai is a, uh, first of all, we we're very, very stressed because we just started breaking into our new cash flow. And here we are going to Dubai with not very many financial resources, believe it or not. But who wants to turn on a free trip to Dubai? We can barely afford a free trip. But nonetheless, we were out there. And my wife got into a big, 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 big argument. Remember those arguments that not only leave the hotel room, but go into the hotel hallway and into the hotel elevator? That's one of the arguments that, wife, that my wife and I were having. I was telling my friends, there's this couple that's here that I think they're going to do good things here. And she says, oh, really? I said, yeah, these guys are doing great things. I said, let me introduce them to you. I said, so these are the guys. He says, Patrick, you sure they're going to do good things? I said, yeah, I'm telling you, they are. He says, buddy, earlier yeah. we were in the elevator with them and it was so awkward. They were screaming at each other the entire time in the <laughs> elevator. We couldn't wait to leave. <laughs> we thought they were going to. I said, what are you saying? He says, Pat, I'm telling you, this was on. So then he brought it up to you guys. My point is this. The reason why we're able to get through that arguments that we were able to get through that area of embarrassment because my wife and I were very, very clear and at this point intense about where we wanted to go in business. And we didn't agree on a lot of things. And because it was a heated discussion, we still went through the trip and we still came back from that trip, fired up, regenerated, pumped up. And 2015 began the year we started changing our lives. So in order to scale successfully, you've got to be clear on what that business is scaling it towards. Oftentimes, people are, find themselves in this circle. For example, if think about this. You're, you're, you're kayaking, right? Instead of going on both sides, or you're rowing, and one, one oar is pulling. You're just going to end up in large circles. And so when my wife and I decided to come in business together, and by the way, a lot of couples in business today don't do the business together. They don't operate a business together. And people say, yeah, they could be foolish to ever work a business together with your wife. Are you kidding me? It's already hard enough to be married. I know, but as I look and, and I study the Bible and I read stories and I look at the ways that businesses and families and dynasties were created, you know what I recognized? It's a king and queen. It's a husband and wife. 
is royalty put together to create a, and build a kingdom and reign over the kingdom, reign over that empire, whatever situation it was, but it was husband and wife. And, and it was only until the industrial age that husband left the house, wife stayed home with the kids. I mean, even look at farms back in the day, the way America was built. There was a ranch, there was a farm, husband worked the farm, he brought home the kill, he brought home the harvest, and guess who takes care of the kill? Who takes care of the harvest? Who butchers, who cooks, cleans, who takes care of the kitchen, who took care of the house? These are traditional roles, I know. It's nothing sexist about it, in my opinion, but these are just traditional roles that many men and many women have operated on for years, for centuries. And so we operate and we got clear, and regardless of the perception of how people perceived us, that I realized as just an independent agent that I was operating in for 13 years as just a life insurance agent. And I was capped. I was stuck. But I loved my business. I loved helping families. I loved being in the neighborhood, in the communities, preaching and talking about financial literacy, retirement planning, to help people in that demographic that weren't getting financial help. And I was able to provide a resource that was provided by a business and a service that helps people understand what financial products and services were most appropriate and suitable and affordable for them. Now I bring my wife into the mix and she's fired up about it. She's excited about it. She left her job at, at Stryker uh, Medical and Selling Hospital Beds to go and visit with me. We didn't care what the perception was about husband and wife or what mom and dad or aunt and uncle thought about us going in business together, operating a business together. So that was number one. Number two, we got very clear on dividing and conquering, meaning that we would operate in two different business roles between my wife and I, because naturally her skill sets were stronger than areas that I was weak at. And my skill set were strong in skill sets that she was weak at. So we understood divide and conquer. We understood and we assessed what we're good at and we stayed in the power spot. Now, I give credit to my wife because she's done a whole lot of growing in terms of being able to be confident on the phone, being confident on, on, on conference calls and Zooms, being confident in terms of speaking in front of people. I mean, my wife would rarely ever do a podcast. She'll do it once in a while, but it takes a whole lot of energy for her to do that. For me, this is my power spot. For her, even though she's brilliant on stage, she's brilliant behind the mic, it takes a whole lot of energy for her to do something like that. So I understood the divide and conquer situation. I would do more of the marketing and she'd do more of the selling. There's overlap in between. I'll provide sometimes an iron hand and a velvet glove type of situation to transition from a marketing conversation into an actual sales and, okay, let's do business, let's shake hands conversation or let's get you recruited into our firm or get you recruited into what we're doing type of conversation and let my wife kind of or give you the orientation processing and actually making that uh, happen too as well. So therefore I stay in my power spot in terms of attracting and uh, getting eyeballs and getting attention. The third point would be mentorship on a different level, which we'll get here in a second. But mentorship on a different level says we cannot see further because we're here and we're, if I'm just doing myself and we're just focusing on us, well, this is kind of like us going through it for the very first time. That's when we bought into attending conferences. This we bought into mentorship. We bought into mastermind because we were clear on what those efforts were going to lead to that investment of time and resources were going to lead to bigger clarity and vision we're going to do. Because every time we're in one of those masterminds, every time we're at a, a, a conference or an event that we would attend, not host, that we would, have, would, would attend as students, greater clarity happened in things because sometimes you can't see the picture where you're inside the frame. The reason why we see further is because we, we stand, my wife and I, we stand on the shoulders of giants. You see one way, but a mentor sees a lot greater way and further away and wider away than you can in your current level. So oftentimes entrepreneurs get stuck up in their own process and day-to-day -day operations and they lose clarity. So if you want to scale your business to the next level, what is your business serving? What is the purpose of, now you're past the, okay, let's just get started phase and get past the making some money phase and paying the bills phase, past the survival phase perhaps, then what's the real phase of what you're in? I remember a consultant came to my office one time. She goes, why are you doing this? I said, man, I don't know. I'm always in business for two, three years. I'm in the insurance industry for a few years at this point. I started making $100,000 a year. I was like, yo, bro, I got this, man. No college degree. I don't have to go to college. I'm making money as a single father, three kids. I got this. I'm making money. I'm I can be respectable and you know, just confident in where I was going in terms of raising my family as a single father, three kids. But I was just selling insurance. I was just selling annuities. I was just doing seminars for the sake of doing seminars. 
until a consultant asked me, I said, what are you doing all this for? What fires you up? What excites you about what you do? You know, I, and I, I took a step back. Again, buying into mentorship, buying into coaching, buying into consulting. I actually put it down. So you know what really fires me up? She said, what's that? Is when I share these financial strategies with people, when I show them how annuities work, when I show them what the compound uh, rate of return, how important uh, uh, the rule of 72 is, when I show them the difference between tax now, tax later, and tax-free buckets, when I show them that there are certain ways to build wealth in this country, that you don't have to eat tax like everybody else does. You can earn a retirement lifestyle a lot sooner in your life than having to wait till you're 60, 65, 70 year old to do it. In a moment I start sharing those concepts, I see a client's eyeballs get big. What, this is what life insurance does? This is what living benefits of life insurance does? This is what uh, tucking my way inside these financial products and services does over a 20, 30, 40 year time frame, or in case I die too soon, this is what it does. Helps protect my goals and visions and dreams to make sure they're still in motion long after I'm gone. Yes. And people's eyeballs got big. That's what fired me up. That's what got me excited. That was changing and transforming somebody's life. I was pumped up about that. But here's my reality too as well. I can only see 100, 110 clients a year. I'm only limited to maybe 8, 10, 12 clients a month. Because there's only so many hours in a day. There's so many hours in a week. So many hours in a year. That's where I need to get to the next level. But I couldn't do it on my own. And I'm thinking to myself, do I buy another building or, or invest in another office space and bring on a junior advisor and put them in that office space and I pay for the rent, I pay for the marketing, I pay for the advertising, I pay for the staff. Well, what incentive do they have to stay in business with me long term aside of just being my biggest competition eventually? So these are some of the thoughts I had of why I didn't scale away, why I just decided to stay small. So I, I can't worry about somebody else's action. I can only worry about mine. See, that's a small fingers mentality. But scalability means that the business runs to go from employee, self-employed to business owner, the main the business runs without you always having to be in the day-to-day -day operations pushing the buttons all the time. That means you're still self-employed. You will still be stuck until you scale and create different levels to your business. But you got to be clear, though, on what your business is all about and the problem that it's solving and the service that you're providing to help people's lives become better or easier because you're in business today. Second point, market research. So just like you launched your business, you got excited because, oh, you know, these guys are doing it this way. We can do it better. Or these guys have left the market or this industry wide open and there's nobody filling in that gap or filling in that void. And you can. So it's exciting. You start your business. You start hiring people. You start getting customers. You start getting clients. You start getting foot traffic. You start getting people online. However, but people are now starting to do business with you. Exciting times that you're now tasting the best of entrepreneurs that you don't have to wait for a boss to pay you. Now you're starting to earn what you're worth. But now you're stuck. How stuck are you? Stuck. I'm stalled, really. And worse, other people kind of figured out what you're about. And guess what they did? They started doing the same thing too as well. So you may have been in a position where there was no competition. But guess what now? You've inspired a lot of people. And they're now in the same space as you are. Or you're trying to take on the behemoths that have been ahead of you. Again, you find yourself kind of emotionally, mentally paralyzed between what to do next in terms of scaling your business. And somewhat you feel stuck. And here's the goal. And we'll clearly put it here for you to see. Your goal is to position yourself uniquely in the market, offering a solution so distinctive that no one can truly can compete with you. A great resource for this that Patrick Edwards Reed was called Blue Ocean Strategy. So I'll share with you a case study of how we started our company, PHB Agency. 2009, Patrick David founded the company in October 2009, primarily because, and by the way, he didn't want to start a business, but he was kind of forced into position because where he was free, previous to that, they weren't giving him a seat at the table. He was going to be the, one of the biggest guys at his previous company, and nobody's giving him a seat at the table. Nobody's giving him an opportunity to earn equity ownership, just commissions and fees, just that's it. That's all I'm going to do if I'm going to bust the best years of my life here. So Patrick started PHP in 2009. And what he recognized at that moment on his market research, the multicultural middle income demographic, sadly, was facing decades of being overlooked and underserved. And as the immigrant population in America is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the legal immigrant population is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, that financial services were getting away, 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 away from serving those in the multicultural middle income, and also immigrant demographic. And here's our market research. 
Our market research is like, listen, the average age of an insurance agent, financial service professional is a 60, 65 year old Caucasian male. And you know it. Many of you, if I said, look up a, a Webster's dictionary, a financial advisor, insurance agent, what stereotypical image would be in that picture if we said insurance agent or financial advisor? And you see it on the news all day. You see it in Fox Business, you see it on MSN Money, you see it on all these shows. The general demographic of a financial services professional and insurance agent is a 60, 65 year old, middle aged, older Caucasian male. You're not going to find faces like mine, even though I've been doing it for 25 years. You cannot find faces like Patrick or David doing it for 20 plus years. You're not going to find many faces in the black and brown community in the financial services industry. And we recognized that the insurance industry poorly attracted the multicultural middle income demographic to its ranks. And so 2009, we said, you know what? We're going to recruit not only agents in that demographic, but we're also going to sell to clients in the demographic. Here's why. Many people in America today, and I'm not saying th something you already know, that the average person in America today is not saving any money. The average person in America today is wrapped up in buying crap, stuck in consumerism. Even the media calls folks in America consumer spending, consumer this, consumer that, consumers are going to this, blah, 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 Black, Black Friday. Thank you, thank you very much, consumers, for rescuing the retail industry on Black Friday. What happened during COVID when current president was sending people COVID checks and unemployment checks and stay-at-home checks to incentivize people to stay home? People getting paid four, five, six thousand dollars to stay home. And guess what? Most people did with that money. They shopped. They bought. They didn't stop. They didn't invest. They didn't do their own market research on themselves. Many small businesses didn't do their own market research on themselves. And now they needed a bailout where many businesses were asking for this PPP loan from the government. You know, the PPP loan that the government was giving out that if you keep your people employed, that uh, you don't have to pay the money back. Well, people were abusing it. And just a side note, my wife and I, we never took out the PPP loan. I don't know how to fill out a business loan. You know what we're doing in business? We're saving, capitalizing, stacking cash. So in moments in, mo in our market, we're weak. Our competitors were weak. The economy was weak. We had the cash and capital to move in and acquire businesses or expand our business. And guess what we did? Exactly that. The biggest explosion in our business came right before COVID, going into COVID and right out of COVID. Why? Because we're stacking cash based on our market research. Because a lot of the insurance agents who were 60, 65 years old during COVID, they said, you know what? Done. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm retiring. I'm no longer in the business anymore. Guess what happened to their clients? The clients were looking for an advisor. The clients were looking for an agent. The clients that were help, the advisors and agents that were helping them retired because they didn't know how to use Zoom. They didn't know how to get online and do virtual meetings. We did. So when we recruited and attracted a younger demographic into the insurance industry, the average person in our company today is a 34-year-old Latina. And guess who the highest income earners of the company are in our company today? Women. Do you think that was by mistake? Or that was by market research. That was by default. And today, one of the largest attractors of women in the multicultural demographic into the industry today is through our company. Large attractors of immigrants, legal immigrants who've got their green card to the insurance industry, financial service industry, is our company. And these are things that we did to build ourselves to a $300 million exit a couple of years ago. When they said, hey, hey, Sapala, based on your shares of PHP agency, here's a check. You want to cash out now? I'm like, they give it, they... Give us an opportunity to cash out. Boy, was that a fat check? It was a fat check. And based on our market research, guess what we said? Yo, babe, you want to continue going to run? Yeah, big. You know why? Back to number one. We were clear. We are clear about what we wanted. We were clear about generational wealth. We we're clear about being a hero to our families. Not that we're being labeled in a category of perfection, but a category of constant and never-ending improvement. When we decided to stick with our business and we decided to roll our shares in the next big deal, you know why we did that? Because our market research said, you know what? There's not a lot of insurance marketing organizations in the insurance industry today that's gone public. And when we decided to partner together with PHP, we partner together with PHP agency, partner together with Integrity Marketing Group, guess what? The potential is, not to say it's going to, but the potential is, the possibility is, we're going to go public. And because of our market research, guess what? Here's a company that we decided to partner with through PHP agency, Integrity Marketing Group. Let me tell you a little bit about Integrity Marketing Group based on market research. Currently, Integrity Marketing Group has over 4.3 million clients. 
Integrity Marketing Group, just in itself, collectively all the companies that they've acquired and partnered together with, over $25 billion of annual new premiums produced every year through Integrity Marketing Group. Over 12 million people are covered through insurance through Integrity Marketing Group. Over 500 plus insurance carrier relationships are through Integrity Marketing Group. Over 550,000 insurance agents are Integrity Marketing Group. Over $40 billion of assets under management are with Integrity Marketing Group through the leadership and ownership of Brian Adams. And guess who led us to him? Patrick McDavid. So there's a benefit of being clear. There's a benefit of having market research to a $300 million exit. And now you see Patrick McDavid taking on the media industry, taking on the consulting world. And he's left the keys to guys like myself and my, my partners in business, Rudolph and Ceci Vargas and George Ply. We've got many other people in the field advisory board that's going to be driving this company to a billion dollar company, a $20 billion company. And that's exciting. You know why? Because the current market research says that still people in America are still underserved and overlooked when it comes to financial products and services. The natural move of insurance companies and financial services companies, sadly, is still to the older, richer, wealthier demographic, regardless of ethnicity. So we want to stand in the gap to help those who are overlooked and underserved. And guess what? We don't have a lot of competition. Blue ocean strategy number three with a clear objective and comprehensive market research and you're clear about where you're going now it's time to create a plan of action a business plan now this is not your typical business plan where you're writing a business plan so therefore a bank or an investor can invest in your company no this is a business plan for you which is a map is a guideline for you to follow to focus on because on a day-to-day -day grind and a week-to-week -week grind and month-to-month -month grind guess what we are prone to forget which is the first point which is clarity of why we're doing this to begin with because so guess what that business plan allows you to do? It allows you to stay clear on your current movement, your current initiatives, your current domination of your industry. And so therefore you have success in your business to make sure your investors are happy, to make sure that your clients are happy, to make sure your associates and people that work for you are happy, to make sure your vendors and providers are happy, to make sure the people that you do business with in the community are happy through that business plan. So every year you have to have some form of one sheet, two sheet business plan to get you clear about what you're doing, why you're doing the market research that you're going to dominate, the gaps that you're filling, the opportunities that you are taking advantage of through a business plan. So you get your clarity together, you get your market research together, you put inside a business plan, you get your projection, your future goals, you put together in a one-page business plan. And one thing I've understood working together with a lot of entrepreneurs is that they get so excited about their widget they get so excited about their product. They get so excited about their patent, their technology, but they forget what? Having a plan to get customers, having a plan to get eyeballs, having a plan to get some people to start talking about your product, your service, your widget, your technology, your unique selling proposition. People don't see it. You see it. Your partner sees it. Your wife sees it. Your husband sees it. But guess who don't see it? The most important people, people that buy from you every year, we put together a business plan every year, sitting down in person, taking a day of our December to business plan for the next year. That's worked for us every December, every December, every December. We're either in Dallas or in LA, we're in Florida with Patrick but David, we're doing business plan. Again, you got to find your mentor. I found mine. You got to find your mentor. And as our company continue to grow and grow and grow, and guess what we also started realizing as we scale our business, special sales organization, we saw what happens when people don't have money and they start making money. They stop working in a capacity and speed of when they were broke, and now they got money and the pillow's soft now because there's money in the bank that we need to find, and, and maybe their eyes got bigger or, or certain attitudes and behaviors aren't becoming apparent that weren't there before when they were broke and still surviving, but now they're starting to show because now they get paid, and yes, money does change people. Money does magnify character in people. That's why I love money. For those of you Christians out there, 1 Timothy 6.10, I know the scripture, don't tell me. It's love money. I love what money does to expose character. You know why? Because the people that have good character and they're bigger givers, guess what happens when they got money? They give more. Guess what happens when people that make money and they're stingy? They're stingy more. They're greedy more. But I remember one year because our company started getting bigger and we wanted to make sure that the direction of the company as we continued to scale would still be grounded and anchored on certain morals, values, and principles. And so uh, one of the funnest trips we took is that we took a surprise trip, destination unknown, and Patrick took us on a private jet 
destination unknown. We landed, didn't know where we're at. Come to find out, we're in Jekyll Island in Georgia. And for some of you that understand uh, the books of capitalism, uh, understand this, the creature of Jekyll Island was created, the Federal Reserve Bank. So we're actually having a meeting in the Federal Reserve Room there in Jekyll Island, in the same room that a secret meeting between the Senate and 12 other entrepreneurs were held in Jekyll Island. And what came out of that meeting? The tenets and the script and the outline for creating the first ever Federal Reserve Bank. The motivation and inspiration for us to establish a guideline of morals, values, and principles that helped us establish a signers meeting where we got together as the leaders of the company and once put together three, uh, uh, we put together three different categories. I, we never, I will do this. We will do this. We'll never do this. I, we never on the declaration of values and principles. And for two and a half days, we just argued over a word in a sentence of one of those declaration of values and principles. And so it became something we got invested in, something that brought out the best of us, the vision, again, back to clarity of what the company is about to buy. As we scale into that one to a $300 million company, into a billion dollar company, into a $20 billion company, into a legacy type of company, we put that down inside our business plan. We put that down inside this declaration of values and principles. And all of us signed it. There's a secret thing that we did. And you'll never know until we get to heaven and we'll let you know what that is if you care to know it in heaven. But we signed something and we declared certain things. We prayed over it, that this is a future direction of a company. It was a solemn moment, a moment we'll never forget. But that was a key meeting for us to establish what the future direction of our company is going to be. Because you don't want to end up creating a bottleneck or, 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 or situation where people are coming and going, revolving door. But why, if, if, that, if, if your key leaders are constantly leaving you, why? Well, maybe you don't have a clear business plan on the morals, values, and principles or standards of which your company is abiding by, in addition to obviously providing products and services to the marketplace. But how is your company running? Is it such a corporate entity that it feels like there's no soul to it? Is there a human being running the company that has empathy and understands people's needs and desires? That uh, I understand protecting company, protecting the mission of the company, protecting the future of the company, being company people, but at the same time too as well, there's a humanization factor in building a company as such. The company still doesn't have to be faceless and heartless. The company can still have a heart, a brain, a soul, a spirit. If that's something that you want or something that you care to do, people that we coach and mentor, have that capacity when they're growing their agencies in the insurance industry. And the fourth one would be KPIs, key performance indicators. Some people call it objectives and key results. What is the data, the numbers? What are the numbers that you're tracking on a daily, monthly, even weekly basis to make sure that you are setting your company for scale and it's predictable and you can have a nice solid projection of it in the next 12 months? What are those key performance indicators for us? We drive everything to four behaviors. We drive everything and reduce everything to four behaviors of activities that grows a company. For activities, things that we have to do on a weekly basis, which leads to four results and deliverables on a weekly basis. So our OKRs and KPIs are four and four. Four activities that lead to four results that gets us to our end goal of our business plan on scaling our company and hitting the projections of the numbers that makes everybody profitable and happy. Oftentimes, many sales leaders and business owners, CEOs, just, well, they just wing it. They kind of figure it out on a day-to-day -day basis. But imagine every day you look into your app, and that's what we centralize everything into our business, is we put everything into an app, into a dashboard, that when you log in on a day-to-day -day basis, you see what that OKRs or those KPIs reflect because our software updates 33,000 times a day. So we have constant numbers that whatever our sales team, whatever everybody's producing, it gets updated on a day-to-day -day basis. By the way, this is great also for competition with inside your business. There's a constant leader's bulletin. When everybody knows in a company where the company stands today, or how many phone calls were made, how many sales were made, how many clients were, were made happy today, how many customer service clients that came in negative ended in positive, customer reviews, whatever your, your OKRs are, how many referrals were given out today could be possibly another one. So if we reduce those, if you guys want to know what we use, those four things are how many phone calls did every individual make on a sales team? How many hiring interviews or recruiting interviews everybody's had on a weekly basis? How many client kitchen table presentations our insurance agents have done on a weekly basis? And how many new associates that just got on board with us had actually been onboarded to make sure that they're converted for somebody that's on board to get an insurance license, to understand the financial products and services that we offer, so that we can go out and help clientele and earn the first income, the first checks. 
Those are four, four key areas. That's it. That's all we focus on. Obviously, there's other things inside our corporate home office that we focus on too as well. But in terms of sales revenue and scaling, obviously through the sales team, is these are four things. Very simple, four things. By the way, every department has to have their four different things. My social media team has a four, a four different things. Our marketing team has a four different things. So every department will have its own eight carats and you as a CEO have to wrap all this stuff together to make sure in next quarter, the following quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, boom, you have a very positive year after constant execution of those months, quarters, half, half a year and a full year as you grow your business. OKRs and KPIs keep us from unnecessary distractions. It keeps us focused on what we're here to accomplish. So when you're in business for yourself and you don't have a business plan, it's like you wanting to journey from the East Coast to the West Coast, go from Florida to California without a map. You kind of go in the general direction. It feels good, sounds good. The sun is setting to the West. It looks good, sounds good. It looks like everything here is pretty much in place where I think it would be. But if you had a business plan that takes you from door to door, numbers to numbers, guess how much time you would save and how much further your business is going to grow and scale in a shorter period of time. If you are clear, if you've done your market research, you got your business plan, and you know which indicators to hit, these KPIs to hit in your journey ahead, which leads me to my fifth point. My fifth point is execution. When it comes to execution, now you start your business, now you're action oriented. Things look good, sound good. Now you got to do good. When I'm talking about you doing good, I'm talking about you not being hallucinated by great ideas, but your feet never hit the ground. We have a saying in our office because people have expansion dreams of grandeur. So listen, I want you to think nationally, but work locally. Keep your head in the clouds to inspire you, but keep your feet in the ground to move you. If you want to grow nationally, guess what you got to do? You got to move locally. You got to move regionally. Then you can have a system and a process and a track record and a, and a case study for people to follow in different markets. And when you have a plan of execution, what's the start time and what's the deadline? Your plan of execution, if it doesn't have a deadline, it's easy to have a start time. And by the way, sometimes people don't even have a start time when it comes to execute. They're planning, they're planning, they're planning, they're planning, but never start. But assuming you do have a start time, what's the deadline? I often ask people, what do you want to do? What are you excited about? I don't know. Back to clarity, number one. Then I ask them, okay, I ask them that, listen, where's the situation now that you have something to quantify? So therefore you look back on your year and say, yeah, man, now I've got something to show for instead of something to owe for. What, what is going to be your tangible result that your husband, your wife, your children say, you know, mommy and daddy were away at the office and they're doing all this work, man, but they're not getting ahead. How come, mommy? How come I see everybody else vacationing? I see everybody else going on those company trips. I see everybody else enjoying their life. I see everybody else doing it. But mommy and daddy, aren't you working just as hard, mommy and daddy? Here's the problem with some mommy and daddies. They're not executing. They look good. They sound good. They talk good. But they don't what? They don't execute good. Don't expect to hire somebody and they're going to do the job for you. They care more about the position than you. Don't hand the keys. Don't trust the keys to somebody that doesn't care about the business to begin with. They just have a job, which is understandable. But nobody's going to love more the business, the more the movement that you're creating, the company that you're creating more than you. So you have to execute. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Leader says, man, if I'm going to execute, if it's going to be, it's going to be up to me. Steve Jobs says here, the common hallucination that great ideas are the only thing you need to produce great products and services. In fact, Steve Jobs explains great execution is what you need. Great execution is what you need. You got to get to work. Is a micro focus Allowing to realize the macro vision. People get caught up into the technology, but they forget what? Execution of relationships. Execution of shaking hands. Execution of being a good leader. And by the way, what is leadership? Executing leadership is getting people to do things they otherwise would not have done themselves. That's leadership, not assumptionship. And here's the thing about execution. Who do you hold yourself accountable to? Who do you have a weekly meeting with to hold yourself accountable to. Is your board of directors? Is your board of directors experienced? Is your board of directors paid and salaried? Is your board of directors, do they have a vested interest to be your board of directors? Or are they just simply an advisory board? Or are they just simply buddies on a block, kicking it there in the stoop, giving you guidance? Is it a formal accountability meeting? We've had weekly accountability meetings with Patrick and David going on nine years now. Weekly accountability meetings, and they're always not been nice. There's months there we've goofed. There was months there that we have not met our numbers, but overall, we have to earn our way, by the way, we have to earn our way with inside our business structure. We have to earn our way to those weekly accountability calls. Is, by the way, is there, I'm just curious for you. 
What would you rather do in your company? Would you rather pay your way or as an entrepreneur? Would you pay or would you rather pay your way for access or would you rather earn your way for access? Huh? It's easy for people to come up with cash to get their way in, to get into the, into the door. But if you earn your way, that's a different story. When you earn your way to a special, special meeting or a special mentorship session or a special conversation versus buying into it, guess what? You value it more. Because money, just, you just blow money, you just throw money at it. And some people don't value the money they throw at it. But guess what you value if you earn your way there? You value the time, the grind, the effort, the blood, the sweat, and the tears. You're going to value that meeting a lot more. See, in our company, even though people are going to start their own insurance agency, people can just buy their way to becoming an agency owner. You have to earn your way to becoming an agency owner. And by the way, that's the way we designed it, to get away from the wannabes, to focus on the really bees, the people that really get it done. Not people that just buy it because you can get credit card or home equity line of credit and boom, and people blow the money that way too as well without understanding the recourse of doing such a thing without execution. People are foolish that way. But people that earn their way by executing their way, guess what? Every bit of milestone along the way they value, they cherish, they embrace. Because the only time you look back in your life is to realize and feel grateful and thankful of how far you've come. So that being said, guys, what are some of your thoughts on scaling and growing your business if you feel yourself getting stuck? What's your thoughts on how to get to the next level? You find yourself kind of doing the same old, same old. I shared the one thing that Patrick could share with me when we started doing the same old, same old. He said, Matt, Sheena, these are the fundamentals of the business. You guys are executing, you guys are killing it. You have the you're accomplishing a lot. You're crushing it. Just don't get bored. I said, what? Don't get bored. Don't get bored. That's guidance. That's advice. I wrote that down. Didn't understand it. Years later, in the same mentorship call, I said, Patrick, years ago, on this day and this day and this year, you told my wife and I to continue doing the basics of the business, the KPIs that we're focused on, focus on a business plan. And you told us not to get bored. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about? I even had a breath or thought of being bored once. What are you talking about? And he laughs. Ha, ha, ha. So exactly what I'm talking about, to Paula. Keep doing it. Do you know why? Guess what happens? You keep blocking and tackling and shooting and passing. Guess what happens? You end up becoming a champion. Champions never get away from the fundamentals of growing a business. Champions never forget the fundamentals of how they got there, the principles and early milestones of success. So oftentimes people think that I got to constantly innovate. This is what's new, 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 new. No, it's the same fundamentals and common denominator in business that got you to examples of success. Now, as you're scaling, you just have to have more people doing that. In your different offices, in your different branches, in your different departments, you have to have certain fundamentals that people are constantly doing. And over time, they're mastering. And now you've created one hell of a company, a company to be reckoned with. If you're just nothing yet, nothing announced, but with us getting together, and by the way, that's something that you would invest in. Would that be a something that would bring any value to you to grow from your company, from where it's at today, to a next level, next best version of you, next best version of your company? If that's so, again, please put it in the comment section below. Love to see if that is something that you, the marketplace, will love to do an experience together. That being said, make sure you subscribe, hit like. Till we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart. Be money smart today. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.